Are there any uh, amendments to the agenda this evening? Hearing none, we will move on to public comment. Is there any public comment at this time? All right, there is time later in the meeting for public comments. So if you have something you want to say, there's another opportunity towards the end of the meeting. Okay. Uh, then we will get started with the reports. First up is Sherry, superintendent's report. Thank you. Good evening. Um, I'll quickly move through the, the high points of my report. First, I wanted to thank the building and grounds team for an excellent job of preparing our campuses. We had a very busy summer. There was a lot going on. I was able to tour each campus uh, the two days before school started and classrooms were clean, hallways were clean, the grounds were in great shape. So I just really wanted to thank our, our b and team for doing such an excellent job and they were really busy this summer. Um, our opening day, I will say, was a very joyful event. We had Ward President Carrie Bristow open and get everybody laughing to begin with, which is always important. Um, we celebrated the hard work of the teachers and staff and recognized uh, many of the, um, the new piece of works they were doing or our wins from last year. We shared a tool to examine our equity data concerns, including our economically disadvantaged students and behavioral reports for male students. And we presented the professional goals for the leadership team. And then finally, we did screen the movie, The Right to Read, around the importance of literacy um, as part of our opening day. Um, I had the pleasure of bringing our two student board representatives to the diversity symposium of thought leaders in Ithaca, New York. So that's why we weren't here at the last meeting. I just want to say they had over 50 superintendents, principals who were all part of their session, um, well over 50. So it was really great to have them there and see that. Um, I wanted to share my goals for this year. Um, we work as a leadership team to identify our goals. Um, mine include working with the Unified Arts team to investigate the impacts of our, and opportunities of our new elementary schedules, facilitating the review of our portrait of a graduate and the completion of our new MVSU strategic plan, and to provide leadership in the realization of our new middle school and high school. All right, are there any questions or comments for Sherry? Thank you, Sherry. Uh, next up is Rap for the Director of Technology and Innovation. Uh, good evening, everyone. Um, two pieces I'd like to share with you tonight. So um, at the start of the year, um, you may notice that there's not any, any enrollment numbers in, in your board packet. So the reason is at the start of every school year, we take 10 days to clean our enrollments to make sure that they're accurate. So students who may have moved out of district and may not have schools. Um, can be removed from those enrollment numbers. Um, after 10 days, we should have accurate numbers. So next month, I'll have accurate numbers for you um, in the board report. I will say, after looking um, briefly at the numbers and estimating, it looks like our enrollment will be close to last year, perhaps a little bit lower. Um, but we'll learn more in um, And the second piece is, I just wanted to welcome a new member to our tech team. So Titus Percy. Um, Going just as an IT specialist, he is a recent graduate of Windsor High School and uh, was a, uh, enrolled in the Hartford area Korean Technology Center last year and is a, a new IT specialist who's helping us out throughout the district. Thank you, Raph. I just want to bring out one. I wanted to um, welcome our latest uh, addition to our leadership team. Brandon Hill is here, who is our new principal from Reading Elementary School. I apologize for not seeing it. Yeah. All right, um, the next report will be from the Director of Student Support Services, Shana. Hi there. Since we last met a month ago, uh, we've been hard at work welcoming many new staff and students to our special education department. Amanda Rank, uh, who has her office in the high school, but has a district-wide position, and Shelly Parker, uh, along with the principals and veteran educators in every building, have been working tirelessly to support and guide all the new special education teachers and our new paraeducators so that they're in an optimal position to best support our students and our families. We've been reaching out to new families to welcome them to the district, allay any anxious feelings they might have and answer their questions and help them know, who do I call when I have a question about this or that? Because this is you know, all a new experience to them. 
Uh, we also know that over the summer, many of our students, both returning students and new students, experience a lot of change, and sometimes they might be experiencing a crisis. So we're always ready to support those students and their families through those situations, um, because that beginning of the school year is um, very unpredictable for some families. So we've been really working hard to just get students in school and make sure that they're able to access all the things in a typical school day. Thank you very much. Any comments or questions for Shana? All right, next is the Director of Curriculum uh, Instruction and Assessment. Hi everyone, this is Jen Stanton, Director of Curriculum Instruction and Assessment. Um, you'll see in my board report a few updates about the beginning of the school year. First, we had our new teacher onboarding program, which from 23 participants last year was down to nine. So that's a really nice negative trend there um, to get those teachers onboarded. And we also help partner them with mentors. So that's also happening for them to have a little bit of support here at the very beginning of the year. Um, our in-service, as Sherry said, was very well received, um, where 96% of our faculty felt welcome by that particular event, which is a pretty good number, I'd say. Um, our tuition reimbursement so far, teachers have access over 25 credits. Um, that's since July. So this is a very robust program where teachers get to access up to six credits according to the uh, collective bargaining agreement. And so I just wanted to say thank you for that because that's a very important part of us continually improving our program. Um, I also wanted to remind everyone that we have lots of information about curriculum instruction and assessment on our SE website. Please go there if you ever have questions or send me an email. And I wanted to give one shout out, if I could, really quick, for the seventh grade team. They had their very first campaign. They went to Emerald Lake Campground with nearly 60 seventh graders for a bonding experience um, that included a couple of thunderstorms, um, a flooded tent a bear sighting, and um, a little bit of a midnight scare where someone thought they were scratching at their tent and like emptied everything out of their tent. Um, it was a wonderful <laughs> bonding experience. Um, and I just want to say the seventh grade team put so much time and energy into planning that, and it just really adds to our curriculum. It's not a part of our written curriculum, but it is a part of what really makes uh, meaningful learning for our students. So shout out to them. Thank you, Jen. Any comments or questions? All right, um, next we have our student representatives, Owen Corsi and Aiden Kiovella. I can just start since I'm here. Um, so I'll keep it pretty light because I've only been here for like six days, but um, the Social Action Club had a lot of like turnover in terms of its leadership through the spring and the fall because um, the advisor, who is our new fellow, Suman Krishna, uh, is moving on to uh, Sao Paulo. So, I've been dealing with our new new boot director, and um, and we're kind of working on restarting up the club for for this coming school year, and like instituting some more permanent uh, kind of infrastructure there. Um, and then you know briefly just meeting with students from from Ithaca at the symposium with Ms. Souza and Aiden and Dr. Stain uh, was really like eye opening to me. Like we uh, had a lot of kind of interesting conversations about student voice and even the idea of like a democracy in education. So kind of like radical stuff, but it was it was really uh, fun to see that, hear a different perspective. Um, and uh, definitely with regards to the mascot conversation, that's something that was brought up then, uh, was brought up uh, all throughout last year. And I think the student body, whether, whether pro or anti, is eager to have that conversation. So we'll be dealing with that in our leadership summit uh, next month, almost almost month to date and uh we'll be bringing in some speakers from Middlebury College and doing some breakout sessions relating to math guide our manifesto and uh a code of conduct. Thank you Owen. Aiden would you like to um continue? Uh yeah of course um <clears throat> good evening everyone uh it's been a very exciting uh, few days back in school. Um, I'll touch up a little bit on the Ithaca Symposium that Owen started to talk about, and I'll also talk about just kind of the general student body, like how we're doing in the school. Um, students are adjusting to the new uh, waterfall schedule. We're kind of reversing it, sort of, but the idea 
is still there. Um, students are getting used to that and they're really liking that change. Um, athletics seems to be a big hit uh, with a lot of uh, good wins um, in the first few weeks. I know that uh, the Friday night football that all students really look forward to um, has come back. So uh, students are really excited about that. Um, and also just a new layout of the building. Uh, we changed a little bit with the uh, middle school and high school kind of moving a, uh, around a little bit just to get the middle schools more, middle school is more comfortable in their uh, school environment. So uh, that adjustment is going over well with the students. Um, a little bit about the symposium. Um, Owen, myself, um, Superintendent uh, Ms. Sousa, and Dr. Jen Staten, we all went to Ithaca, New York to uh, represent the Superintendent's Student Advisory Board and also the um, Social Action Club um, to present our work around the Student Manifesto and uh, student voice and policy decisions and policy making in our district. <clears throat> uh, the symposium went over very well with over 50 administrators attending our presentation. Uh, it was very, like Owen said, eye-opening to get a lot of just diverse points of view. Um, and I think it will really help us as we take our next steps with this document and with our work, um, with the most you know, recent and kind of upfront step being the, uh, the leadership summit happening. Uh, I don't know the exact date, but it's kind of like mid-October. So we're very uh, excited about that. And um, it's pretty good to be back. All right, thank you. Any questions or comments for our student members? I did want to say to you both that I had a reach out from the Vermont Student School Board Association regarding how um, students are welcome to our board. And I explained what our process had been and that you were, had full voice at the table and you submitted reports and he wrote back and said, wow. <laughs> so I, I felt good about that. And I think it's <laughs> been a great addition to um, our work. Thank you. All right, now uh, the next um, appointment we have is a new build update. I can take that one since I'm named in the agenda is taking this one. <laughs> uh, yeah, I see that the purpose is uh, to talk about design progress. I had a little bit of a different uh, presentation I wanted to make to the board tonight. Um, I guess, but before I did that, Jim, were there any updates we wanted to provide? I see Lee's on about the design. Um, I, I can just tell you the design process of different team members, and we've got a bunch of different teams working on this, have spent four to six hours with Lee and the team going through mechanicals, going through IT, going through the, the things behind the scene, um, you know, where are the lights, what type of toilets, what type of faucets, um, you know, where are the the closets for the custodians and what, what's in them and where's the closets to technology and what's in them and lighting and all that. And so a lot of this stuff that is just part of a new building is really starting to take shape. We're, we've made a lot of design decisions on that so that as they start putting together the first price, they actually have something to base it on. Yeah, and we've, uh, we had our first from a, like a, communications um, group, I guess, uh, working group within the new build working group. There's groups within groups. Uh, we had our first uh, market on the green. We were at uh, last week, uh, Sherry and Carrie and, and I were there uh, along with um, uh, Melina McNamee and uh, some other volunteers and presented some of those designs so that, you know, members of the Woodstock community at least could see that and we're starting the process of kind of rolling out communications to our communities and that'll continue for a number of months. Um, the, uh, I guess to that end, we had a, um, uh, an invite, Carrie and I, the Vermont Standard reached out a few weeks ago and asked if we would like to write an update um, about the, the project and uh, fundraising in particular. And I wrote a column that um, talked about how over time uh, with fundraising, how the, the board's efforts to make the project affordable for our communities, and that over time uh, with enrollment growth, we could see um, the uh, tax rates come down, uh, even surpassing the impacts of the, of the new build. Uh, the standard chose the headline for that column as uh, a, a new building, a uh, new school building will um, lower tax rates, right? <laughs> and so um, that, that was, I mean, those are great, be wonderful if that were, were true after year one. But I guess what I wanted to do tonight, though, uh, by way of just kind of update for the board, 
because I do expect as we uh, do more public outreach on the project and uh, things pick up, uh, board members will get questions from members of their community. So I wanted to provide some um, uh, an overview of a model that we put together uh, that kind of demonstrates how that works, how the financials for the project uh, will work. And so I'm going to present here, and this is something that um, different, um, like the new build working group got to see this, uh, the policy committee um, got to see a version of it when we were putting the uh, tax impact policy in place. So I'll put this up here. And um, yeah, so here we go. So this, you already see the, the screen okay? <clears throat> so uh, what this model shows is uh, tax impacts. Currently, and this is based on our um, equalized tax rate. You may remember that from our finance presentations, the time we were approving the budget for this year, that the equalized tax rate is the rate that is the same for uh, every town in the district. And then you apply the common level of appraisal. You look at how the real estate market has moved since the last time um, properties were appraised in, in a town and th that CLA gets applied. Um, and as a result of that, all of our towns are currently going through those reappraisals, right? I believe uh, uh, Pomfret's completed theirs. Uh, others are, in, uh, are working on it. But the equalized tax rate in our school district uh, for this uh, tax year is currently $1.51, right? Um, and that's what this yellow line represents in, the, uh, in this model. That is flat spending. Um, this is what would happen if, um, you know, there were no, none of the increases that we've seen to the school budget over, you know, the last several years uh, manifested over the next, say, 30 or 40 years, things like health care um, increases, uh, get, uh, raises to, to faculty, um, that we could keep our spending absolutely flat. That's um, just not a, uh, a, on a, on a tax rate standpoint, that's, that's probably not a, a realistic thing, certainly not from a, um, um, you know, from a planning perspective, but I think it's something that everybody would, would love to see. This um, orange line or red line that you see on the model, it represents, uh, as, as we've reported, I guess, at recent meetings, the, um, uh, the school district, uh, excuse me, the um, um, AOE commissioned a study of, of school buildings. And as a result of that study, um, it was determined that our school district uh, had the second worst buildings in the state and that we have approximately $22 million worth of repairs that are urgently needed to the middle school and high school building. That red line, what this represents is if we make those repairs to the building, right? And then in um, 10 years or so, when that building fails, we have to replace it and we have to replace it with something pretty modest, right? Because um, you know, we, at that point, you know, would have kind of spent the money that we have and um, taxpayer interest in a project like that probably wouldn't be very high. The blue line is the new bill. Um, that is the one that we're talking about in planning. And as you can see, it caught, um, this spike here is, it represents about a 30% impact to tax rates uh, that would be unsustainable. Uh, several school districts around the uh, state have failed to pass bonds uh, proposing impacts at, at that magnitude. So how do we abide by the policy that we've passed to not have tax rates exceed 16%? Um, so these are inputs, right? These are various aspects of the, of the, of the um, financing of the project. This is a bond model and it goes uh, you know, over a course of years and at an expected price of $80 million, the first bond payment, this is at 3.75% interest at 20 years. The first bond repayment is what causes that spike. It's about $7 million, right? And there you see the tax impact of about 30%. I think that's what policy committee members should, should remember that from our discussions. But over time, unlike a, a residential mortgage, the bonds that you take out for public construction projects go down over time. They're not uh, level each year. So on this, say, 20-year bond, you can see that it starts at $7 million, and by the end of the bond repayment, it goes down to, say, $4 million, right? Okay, still way of, uh, and, and at that point, due to inflationary factors, um, the impact of the project, you know, goes down, um, you know, quite a bit. Okay, so um, 
how do you make the project affordable for for taxpayers, and how do we um, kind of you know meet up for this? The first thing is to increase the bond term, right? Uh, both the bond bank and the USDA, who we're speaking with about potentially financing the project, offer thirty. The USDA will go to forty years. You can also potentially uh, reduce the uh, the interest rate. We've got three seven five from the bond bank. Maybe we do a little better than that. Uh, three two five, say. If you go back to the draft, you can see that that makes the project, you know, more affordable. But the most um, significant thing that we can do is to um, is to drive enrollment, right? Um, if you drive uh, enrollment over time. Um, let's say, just going historically, I'm going to pull up, this is a very colorful chart I've shown in past meetings. The very right column here shows historical enrollment in our school district. Go back 20 years and you can see that we had about 200 more kids. I talk about this in the column in the paper, that over the last 20 years, we've lost about you know 200 um, students. And as a result, um, you know the tax rates have gone up. Equalized pupil uh, excuse me, per pupil spend is the most significant driver of tax rates. So if you go back to the model and you say, okay, um, if we can, you know, in year one, say gain 10 uh, students and then do that every year, right, with the new school building and um, making an effort to, to drive enrollment, then that's what your impact to taxes looks like. And conversely, if you were to make the um, the members of our school district, our, our students and our, our parents, um, you know, live through the, the kind of construction that would take to, to fix the building, we're probably going to accelerate um, the decline in our, our student population. And this is cap, by the way, uh, it's capped at 1200 equalized pupils at the top and 800 at the bottom. Not everybody's going to have the option not to attend our schools. Um, and if you, if you put that in, you can see that Tax rates, if you go on the uh, maintain the old building path in time, will be these are very divergent paths, right? The tax rates will go up and up as we lose students and try to uh, maintain this building, and will go down, down as we drive enrollment higher. But we still have this problem here, right? This spike in year one, and that's as I say in the the, the paper from a couple of weeks ago. This is where uh, private fundraising comes in. To date, we've raised $3.2 million against the goal of $5 million. Um, and put that in, and we have the goal to raise $500,000 every year. And if you go back here, you can see uh, that fundraising, as a, when you apply it to the early years of the bond, um, makes the two scenarios pretty much negligible. But the future of that is tax rates going down, down, down over time versus up, up, up. So um, I can share, I think it's available uh, for anybody uh, who wants to play with it. Uh, the property tax calculation tab, uh, anywhere that's blue is meant to take an input. And um, I guess uh, that's kind of the, the numbers behind uh, what might be uh, appearing in the papers in case uh, board members get questions. Uh, any questions for me? Sam? Okay, well, no. I was going to say what's really cool about this is I've met with a few taxpayers. I plugged in their house values and showed them the tax rate from the tax impact from their houses. And that's a cool tool because then I can sit with you and say, all right, your house is worth this much. This is what it's going to do to you. So we can individualize it. And this is what was what I was going to say, but that would be a great thing that if we could add it to the website of the new build of like, yeah. uh, hey, how, how what are your taxes going to look like if you own this kind of house? And we can like then this is way too complex to do that. that right now. Yeah, but uh, um, but it's really cool to do. Yeah, right now what we've got online is just uh, on the website um, is <laughs> is just this chart that kind of shows if you if you're not income sensitized, that's that first group. Right, and it goes by year going down. Uh, and then if you are income sensitized, what your tax impacts would be. Again, this is equalized. Um, you know, currently we've got um, some massive kind of inflators going on because the CLA has got juiced by the uh, real estate around the last couple of years. And you can see some of these assumptions. Uh, Matt? Yeah, when we passed the policy to not increase the um, tax by 16, more than 16%, did we, did we carve out the per people? 
spending, like being driven down by more kids? Yes. Yeah. Um, enrollment is one of the, the factors that we get credit for. Yeah. Sam? Um, I just want to finish what I was going to say. I apologize. I have my phone on no ring, but when he calls me, it still makes noise. Um, uh, I had a couple of questions. Um, can you bring the, the graph thing sure. back up there? Also, this is amazing, and I also do not envy any of this. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Um, can that is showing if enrollment goes up a lot and you get um private um funds? Correct. Correct. Can you just show it where you don't get enrollment up and it's sure. just for the private funds? I'm just curious. Mm -hmm. We'll take out the enrollment loss <laughs> and the trend. And I know you're right when you say that enrollment is significantly down. People, I think a lot of people in this area, they go, well, we just had all these people move here from COVID and everything like that. And yes, that's true. But I know from experience of going to these schools that the enrollment is significantly lower than when I went to school here. I graduated, it will be 20 years um, soon. Um, and sorry, I took out the enrollment. Did you want to see just fundraising? No, I just, yeah, just with the yeah, fund. That's, that's, that would be with, if we raise five million by 2031, which I think mm -hmm. we're well on uh, the way on with right? the 3.2. And then we can sustain, uh, and they, they, the goal there is then to, um, you know, develop a fundraising capacity yeah. and annual capacity that we could, you know, generate 500k, which is pretty modest. Yeah, I know. I was gonna say, I think you're what you're expecting for being able to um, fundraise is more than reasonable. Um, I wanted to just get an idea of what we were looking at, even if our enrollment didn't go up, just because even though I know it's capable, we all know the housing situation around here like where do people get to live that yep. potentially want to enroll so um so to even if we don't get an influx of people moving to the area it's good to know that that um number is still what we would be paying anyways um with the current um school the way it is um and then also trying to fix it um and then i had one other question i i do i do you think it's also important to keep in mind this is probably this is estimates to how the bond for the new school build will affect the tax rate this is not factoring in any of the other bonds that the town might that outside of the school might also, yeah this is just the school budget yeah so that's another thing that you know might be scary for people too in this time because i know that the town is also looking at not sure. that that's anything that we but there are other things that are going to raise the tax rate besides yeah for, for woodstock it's the same pocket yeah yeah that's just some, some add in this for i think and then okay. sure um, adam bryce and then Lara. ben my admiration for your uh diligence and level of detail um the 10 person you know the estimate of trying you know or target of 10 per year um how did we get, how did you arrive at that? Or how did, how does that number, um, where's that number come from? Yeah, I mean, so we've been very passive as a school district, right? In terms of enrollment. I mean, look, there's, I, I know, Cody, you, you're not passive. You've been going out to some, some schools recently and doing presentations and things, but it's just additional duty for our, our current uh, staff, right? If we get intentional about it and where this comes from is conversations I've had others have had with uh, some of the independent schools in the state who are very intentional about driving enrollment in their areas, and they do it with a, a public school mission, right? Uh, and, and specifically, I'll talk about uh, Burn Burton. Um, they've got a full-time development staff, six, right? Six FTEs. One person just travels the world uh, recruiting kids for international student uh, uh, international student fairs, right? Now, I'm not suggesting we do that, but if we brought on one person, a halftime person, like we have with fundraising to start, uh, to focus on communications, all the great things that we're doing with uh, structured literacy in our district, with math uh, education, um, that and um, just, you know, going out there and, and making the case, um, you know, I think we'll have a pretty good shot. Yeah, and there's a, a couple of ways that enrollment that comes from. One is 
surrounding communities that have school choice, right? Hartman, for instance, right? School choice town that sends a lot of kids to um, uh, over to uh, Hanover presently, but historically they sent a lot more kids to Woodstock. I know this feels like we're starting to compete with other schools, but it's kind of where we are, right? And the, the other factor that we've used is in Pillington, there's about 500 living unit, units planned, of which about 250 of them are supposed to be year-round residential, and the other 250 are going to be seasonal. Mm -hmm. And if you mm -hmm. just have half a child per year-round living unit, that's 125 kids. Yeah, I talk about that in the article. The uh, What is it, 700 acres that the town of Kennington just bought for um, workforce housing? You know, I think it's, I don't know how uh, aggressive they're going to be about that, but you can expect a bump, you know, from that from that population. Uh, just a second, Cody. Yeah. I think we got a couple. Bryce first, maybe. Bryce and then Lara. Okay. Yeah, sorry, I have my camera off. I'm I'm cooking dinner, guys. But um, I just just it's actually right in line with the last two questions. It's just a comment that I I know I've brought up in the past. Um, for me, it wasn't so much about you know attracting people in from you know outside the country, outside the state. But I, just a reminder for folks, especially since the the high school in Ludlow closed. Both Ludlow and Mount Holly are choice towns. Menden is a choice town. Not everybody realizes. Um, Heartland that we already discussed and then Stockbridge and those are all towns that border us and we have students already from those towns so you know I think that is a more realistic uh, in my opinion where probably the lion's share of the increased enrollment would would come from and we could do something as simple as we did in Heartland when we voted and moved the, the bus route there a few years ago and and see that a modest increase you know from those from those towns by potentially adjusting bus routes so uh, anyway, more of a comment, but I just wanted to throw out there that we are surrounded by quite a, quite a few choice towns. You know, not everybody realizes that they all are. Yeah, thank you, Brian. Lara? On the same vein, um, do we have data on how many students live in our district but don't attend our school because they homeschool or go someplace else that we might be able to attract back our own? Folks. I'd say we have limited data on that, but anecdotally, I mean, I think you talk to anybody um, just looking around that there's quite a few, right, who you know, parents who just made the choice to send their kids to a private school, tuition them in uh, elsewhere. One of my neighbors uh, tuitioned their son uh, into Hanover High, uh, just as you know, I thought that was a better choice, right? So we do get data on home to study students that comes in four times a year, so we were able to track that. We were able to increase our freshman class this year by 22 students, and that's from a um, majority of surrounding towns. So it was really good to see some of Cody's efforts, as well as others, to bring in students from Weathersfield and Cavendish and yeah. um, other surrounding towns. Yeah, that's what I was, that's what I was going to add, is that we have 22 new freshmen, and thanks for the credit, but it's not all me. I think our counseling department did a majority of that work. Gabby spent some time visiting those elementary schools. and. I think the focus, kids are coming to our school because our programs are great. Our, you know, our building isn't, but we're still getting new, you know, like that's that speaks a lot about our, our school and what we offer. My question about your graph is you have um, 10, you're tracking 10 new students sure. per year when it, when it crosses the 25 where you would need another adult. Is that factored in? Yes, actually, I, yeah, I built in a built in cost, and I can't remember oh, personnel cost for every. Uh, I actually did it for every fifteen, and um, uh, I can't remember what my my bogey was there, um, but it, maybe it was like seventy thousand for every fifteen. Yeah. Anybody else? Yes, Shana. Just to tap on um, one more part of a response to that question. We also had several new students in the special education department whose districts sought us out and chose us to place their students here and for whom we received tuition and reimbursement for those special education services. Yeah, great point. Ben? No. Um, related to the, <clears throat> to the committee, but not specific to this presentation, um, you know, we've made it pretty public now that we're going for the bond in March and just thinking about basic public relations strategies, are we are we really are we positioned and prepared to to sort of take the message to the public and respond quickly and control the message? I 
for a living, I build very controversial projects all over the US. And when people organize against my projects, um, they can be very, very successful if we're not already anticipating that and putting in place like a public relations campaign. I mean, yep. we even hire people to do that for us. Are we hiring anyone to help us with the media? Yeah, a couple. Um, we could consider more, but um, the um, when the the new build activities um, over the summer kicked off, one of the work streams that uh, Lee mm -hmm. Sherwood, our architect, uh, organized was communications group. And he's also got, um, as part of the, the funding that we're you know, providing the architects, um, uh, community engagement, right? So that's built into that plan. Then for the uh, construction manager, the, the next thing on the agenda we're going to talk about is the selection of our construction manager. We have the bids in. Um, they also offer, as part of their services, uh, you know, bond support. It's a crucial part of them you know, getting to the next phase of the project. So... That will be rolled into, uh, I mean, the real kickoff for this is when we get our costing, our final costing that we'll put on the, the balance. Um, and at that point, you know, that's really when we can take the message and say, this is, you know, what the project will cost, right? And we hold people you know, to those numbers. And that's going to happen in December. John? So that, um, my question is going to be, does, do we know the impact on the individual homeowner tax value. So for example, I know it's 1.51% now, 30% and all the numbers, but it's going to increase each person's home values in the, in the area in town as well. And that's why a lot of people are coming to be going, yeah, so it's going to increase my taxes, but my tax rate, like my home value is going to go up by 29% as well. So now I'm going to be going 20, 30% on 29 more percent. Right. So do we know those numbers? Well, it, I guess I don't have a way to forecast those. There are some who may. I think it's a it's a reasonable consideration. Uh, it's one that gets mixed uh, reactions too, right? Because some people want to see their home value preserved and increased, right? Um, others don't want to pay taxes on that. They have no intent of ever selling their home. So you know, why, you know, it's, it's only bad if, if their home value goes up. But um, I think in general, like if you look at like um, the CLA rates, I just, Give you one example. When we closed Prosper Valley, right? For when we took it offline for mold for a couple of years, the I won't say that the, the real estate market froze up there, but there there was certainly less interest in that community without that school. We saw that there out in the CLA, right? So I think in general, um, I mean, right now Vermont's a red hot um, you know property market, but you know, in ten years from now, is that going to be the case? I don't know. All things being equal, a new building, interest in the community investment, those are things that most taxpayers would say are good. Anybody else? Uh, uh, Bob and Bryce, did you have something else to say as well? <laughs> yeah, I have a, a question regarding process. To what extent are we making available uh, to the public or even to board members the results of these meetings with the subgroups or working groups or whatever it, they're called. I know uh, I, I attended one meeting, but are minutes being taken and are they being posted and all these decisions that are unfolding right now for the pricing um, uh, process, is that being published anywhere or how do we get a yeah, hold the, of that? Yeah, about the minutes of the, the new build working group that we've done the last uh, few months, those are uh, those agendas are set and, and minutes are created for those. The subgroups can be like uh, two to four people, right? And so we haven't been doing um, detailed minutes at those meetings. Um, they've really been used for the architects to get the inputs they need to update the design. But I think the thing that, um, you know, is probably most interesting is the updated design itself, right? And the output of that is really the deliverable that I think most people would, would want to see. But uh, it's a good point. I mean, um, there, there could be some... Uh, for instance, the deliberations that we had about the HVAC, right? You, you were a part of, you know, that was that was uh, very interesting. We could certainly make those materials available. We we brought those to the um, to the full board last month um, to show kind of the the impacts of the full geothermal that the working group was recommending. I, I think it would be a great idea to keep that information flowing. Yeah, I agree with you. Yeah, right. Is it possible at some point to make a graph or a chart for people to see where 
the the difference is being shown on what you're going to pay or an increase for keeping the school as is and making the necessary fixes, which are going to have to happen if we choose not to do a new school, opposed to what it is with the new school. Because it seems like those graphs shift relatively quickly, mm -hmm. and the new school would benefit the taxpayers anyways, as obviously it would. But there's already going to be an increase in taxes regardless, even to keep the school as is. So I think it'd be important to let the people know, like, just by saying no to the school doesn't mean your taxes still aren't going up, right? Because there is still a base cost that's going to have to be covered. So then it's less of a difference to just get the better school in the first place. Yeah, I think that's that would be a, a, a great. I'm thinking of like the uh, community engagement, the rollout. Uh, those would be great numbers to show on the slide as we're rolling things out to say like, okay, you vote no, we're going to bring a whole bunch of projects to you as a uh, taxpayer. And if you don't, um, if you don't vote yes to those, we'll have to close the building, right? right? So yeah, and, it, and it's unpleasant, right? Like in this graph, twenty twenty seven is not going to be a, a a pleasant year, and we've got some some hurdles to get through. I mean, yeah, maybe we can do better on the fundraising front than we've than we're kind of conservatively planning it. But um, that's a great point. Sam, it's a little bit of a different topic, but um, a couple of weeks ago. Uh, governor's panel came to the high school um, to speak with uh, local uh, residents and business owners that were affected by the flood. Mm -hmm. It was at the library. It was one of the people asked to um, go. When I spoke, I'm not going to lie. I shamelessly was like, hey, I'm going to put a different hat on right now and talk to you about the fact that the building we're sitting in right now desperately needs to be replaced and is falling apart. Um, I know that's not why you guys came here, but I'm just gonna have your attention. And as a school board member, I couldn't help but so I did, and I gave them a printout on what we're working on. And I brought up the fact that, that you know, one of the things that would benefit, you know, the what can we do for the towns? And I said, you know, schools are important, and we as Act 60 and one of the giving towns that we are you know, a break from that one year or two so that we can better afford some of these things that we need to do would be unbelievable. I mean, it's like, yeah, you know, I mean, of course, they're, they're politicians. They're going to say what I don't want to hear. But I did plug it a little bit, and I think it wouldn't be bad idea to not only just put it all on us to fundraise and get a bond and stuff like that, but also to be potentially really loop, looping in some of our representatives and getting oh, yeah. that. Yeah, I'm sure you're already on. I'm I'm sure I'm preaching to the choir. I'm no, sure. like Tessa. Um, yeah, uh, T uh, Tessa Buzz is on the um, the House Education Committee, which, and she was there. I'm pretty sure. Yeah, yeah, and you know, there's you know they're they're. I can't really give you an update on that tonight, and I don't hold out much hope because there's been a lot of noise. Out of Montpelier about like potentially bringing back, um, you know, uh, school construction aid. To go back mm -hmm. to the model, I mean, the the state's obligation by law is thirty percent. And if we had mm -hmm. that right in the model, that would take the the bond down significantly. In our, that's what it would look like, right at the beginning. Wait, there there. The there's been a moratorium since two thousand seven. Almost every state in the country. Paused it in the run up to the um, to the cool. economic downturn in two thousand eight. The housing boom. Awesome. 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 Yeah, but anyway, that would I mean that would be a game changer. But all of this, I mean, you could look at this as like you know all of this fundraising and and you know having to um, you know emphasize enrollment. And those things are really uh, what we need to do. Uh, you know, in the in this era without um, construction aid coming from the state. Adam has a question. Uh, I do, and um, maybe it's mostly directed at our, our chair of the finance committee, um, particularly yeah. as budget season will be around the corner. Um, but I, and maybe to the board as a whole. But what is the flavor or kind of the interest of you know, particularly in this area? I mean, what Sam's talking about is really, I think, my impression is is more development time, um, and someone that can be doing uh, doing a lot of that work outside of board members. Is that something that we're thinking for this upcoming budget, or has that even crossed your mind? What do you mean by development time? Another, you know, the idea of bringing on another development um, FTE. 
Yes, actually. Um, so on the we're going to have our committee meetings on the 18th, and we'll be talking about priorities for the next year. Two things I'd like to see because they play into this um, plan, right, is um, a full-time fundraiser and a uh, communications and enrollment uh, coordinator. I feel those positions are are self-funding over time, you know, but we'll uh, we'll see what we think about that. Anybody else? All right, well, thank you very much, Ben. It's very helpful and sure. interesting. Um, and I think you now are going to talk about the construction <laughs> manager. Yes. All right. So this is very exciting coming on the heels of, of that uh, that presentation. Let me start. Um, so, yeah, we're a pool of construction manager in the agenda. Um, shoot, this is always gets in the way when you want to do things. Hang on, let me stop my share and pull this up. Okay, so where we'll start is with the Vermont statutes. You thought this meeting couldn't get any more exciting. <laughs> All right, let's see. Okay. Okay, so um, board members may recall that at the last board meeting, we uh, voted to, we, we had uh, put out a request for qualifications from construction management firms. We received three uh, proposals or responses to that request for qualifications and determined that there were three firms that we were interested in sending our request for proposals to. Um, that process is laid out here in Title 16 of the Vermont Statutes, and uh, you know, I'll just go ahead and read the, the relevant parts. This is high cost construction contracts. It lays out the process saying that 60 days prior to the proposed bid opening, that's tonight, um, just to not bury the lead, um, you have to you know, put out a request for qualifications 30 days prior to the proposed bid opening. You put out your request for um, for proposals, and then um, the contract award process uh, is that um, this is the second paragraph: contract for a property construction good or service to be obtained pursuant to subsection B. That's what I just walked through. Shall be awarded to the lowest responsible bid conforming to specifications. Um, you can you can award it to a firm if somebody comes within uh, one percent of that. Is the next sentence. And the board shall have the right to reject the bid found to be not responsible conforming. So um, the process here is that um, tonight is the, the bid opening. Um, so we received, um, you know, stop my share, apologies um, to get to this. Uh, we received three bids from um, construction firms. Uh, the ones that we, we sent our, uh, our request for proposals to. And the first thing I want to show you is the request for uh, proposal um, bid worksheet. Come on, there we go. This is the sheet that we're going to be looking to tonight to make our determination. Let me pull this back up. <coughs> okay, and this is from the, the RFP that we sent out. This is the bid worksheet. The, um, essentially, the, the format of the pricing that we um, needed to uh, or we requested these firms to um, to propose on, and let's see. All right, great. I can go to the no. Do not go. Can you move on? So the next thing we'll look at is the. Um, here we go. The three proposals. So this is the opening. So the three uh, proposals that we received were from uh, Whitey Turner, uh, PC Construction, and Do Construction. So let's. In um, no particular order, start with PC construction and get to the bid sheet. And you can see the price on line eight of uh, eight million nine hundred thirty thousand one hundred thirty one. That's for the services we're requesting. Uh, okay. Oops, sorry. Zoom, you're killing me. Yeah, I'm here. And is there any way you can forward that email address to back them and work to the board member so we can just fill it up? The, um, the email that you have all the attachments from the this? This is the official opening. I'm opening for all of your, but yes. Oh, okay. Okay. After we open them up. After uh, we open them up. Okay, sorry. I didn't mean to disrupt your official opening. No worries. <laughs> 
There we go. Sorry, going back. All right. Um, so we'll look at. So that was uh, Jim. Are you keeping track of these numbers? Yeah. <laughs> Thank you, sir. <laughs> Uh, Whitey Turner's proposal um, it looks like it's a little higher at nine million forty four thousand seven hundred ninety three, and I've learned my lesson. And due construction mm -hmm. well, is Whoa. much lower at five million one hundred nine thousand sixteen. And uh, why is that so low? Uh, well, <laughs> um, maybe they really want to work with us. Yeah. Why are the others so hot? <laughs> Give you a similar answer, but um, assuming that these firms that we pre qualified are all uh, you know qualified to do the work, which we determination we've already made as a board, we are obligated by law to choose uh, uh due construction as our construction firm. Question. Lauren? So the law said that we have to decide if this is responsible and meets the call. I don't know. Yeah, I skipped through all the other pages, right? So, um, you know, and if we if we wanted uh, as a board, we could uh, could send these out for Sam's suggestion, and we could review the proposals and you know make the award decision at our our next meeting. Um, I guess having pre qualified the firms, knowing their uh, their bond capacity, these other sorts of things that that make um, you know the firm qualified. I don't think anyone's going to see anything in these proposals that you know is going to lead us to a conclusion that they're they're not qualified and they're not responsive. Right. Especially where the dips the spread between the low bidder and the next one is more than one percent. Right. Oh, sure. Yeah, you know, the law is kind of strong in that. Or I guess what we could do is make the award decision um, in order to make. You know, but maybe contingent on a review of the of the um, uh, you know the bids, so that um, if there is an irregularity found or something, that we can make the determination that at the next meeting maybe we because you'd have to toss it out and go to the next. Do we have somebody who can read these things and know what they mean? To, <laughs> to we have we have Jim Fenn and Joe Rigoli, our, our, our me. <laughs> administrative members. Yeah, we can read and advise certainly. Yeah, I wouldn't mind if all three of these proposals were emailed or posted somewhere where they could be read. Okay, sure. Let's uh, let's go ahead and attach them to the uh, the meeting minutes, and I can distribute them to the board in the interim. What's, what's yeah. the process for how they bid and the actual cost? The like problem. this, due is substantially less than the other two bids, mm -hmm. so they get the contract. They have to honor the bid. I mean, there's probably some leeway. And yeah, whatnot, there's, right? but it's not like they can just bid low well and then gouge it as it go. I'm assuming. Right, and I mean that's their reputation. Um, I I spent some time with the request for qualification, and one of the things that uh, do prides itself on is, um, you know, and this is for the the overall construction, right? There's a, a number of examples. I can make those available to the board as well, um, but. You know, is is coming in. You know, um, at under close to the amount of their of their pricing. When you when you look at this, and I know it's hard to see that far away. Um, it's a fixed fee for construction. It's a fixed fee for general conditions. There is certainly a percentage um, of additional costs for any change order where the architect and the CM and the owner's rep decide that a change is necessary. So the, if their fee could go up if we change something. But this was we were very careful to do it as a fixed bid so that the fees won't. Thank you. I don't think we can re recognize Lee because it's a board discussion ah, right now. Okay. He can speak at public we'll, on. We'll have to come back to you, Lee. Anna? Yeah, I wasn't able to uh, see where the numbers were dramatically different, but between items number one through seven, is there one category that is making that most of the difference between the other two bids and this bid? Uh, I guess we can look at them. Um, I assume it's going to be a box five, the fee for general conditions. Category five is the significant difference. Um, 
DEW is doing the free bond services for a dollar, where the others were charging a much higher fee. Oh, box one, I see. Yeah, yeah I, I was that. noticing that one dollar and thinking that was kind of uh, you know, curious. And certainly we have uh, a few folks that are in construction that could maybe answer oh, yeah. questions or do a deeper dive into this. It's it's one dollar compared to a hundred thousand compared to. 325,000. So, um, look at box five, Jim. I mean, you got 5.8 million yeah. versus two, you know, two million. Box five is where the significant difference is. Yeah. <clears throat> Matt? Um, can you explain, or maybe Jim would know, if these companies make any other money um, on this building other than the dollar amount in box eight? So, like, does do, for example, want this? business so bids low and then know that they're going to get other they mark up some materials because their construction guys do the work so are they is that is there another so the, the question is do these cms their companies make another dollar on this building other than the amount shown in line eight jim they may have an opportunity to make more money um part of their job is to comply with Vermont law, which requires three bids for each component. So if they happen to have a cabinet shop and we have a half million dollars of cabinetry in this building, they may bid on the cabinet work. And when they open the three bids, if they're a little bitter, then they will be awarded that work. Otherwise, they don't have an opportunity. So I can tell you, I did it job with Trumbull Nelson who had a cabinet shop and they did the cabinet work. It was about a half million dollars of cabinet work and they were the low bidder. Um, and they didn't they didn't have the opportunity to see the bids because we opened the bids with them. So it was you know just like this we opened three bids at the same time. But um, if they have a specialty area where they do work they certainly have opportunities. That doesn't mean they're automatically getting it because they have to compete and follow the state law and the bid process. Thank you. Do we have? So we, we chose, I know you guys chose those three companies. That was the three companies that offered to us. Was there any background done on what was their last project? What does the person that had the project done for them? What does the consumer review that company as? Sure. Not, not what their review is as far as, hey, we did a good job. Here's what it looked like. What does it look like? Three years from now, what's look five years from now, what's look like ten years from now? Mm -hmm. Yeah, each of the requests for qualification, though, these were submitted by the firms, right? right. So um, if they wanted to be disingenuous, I, I suppose they could, but they included um, a long um, list of examples of other projects that they've done around the state. Um, they included letters of reference from other projects, um, superintendents or headmasters at different schools. So uh, what I mean is, do we know if? Like we've had numerous builds in, in the area of, of, of things like mm -hmm. fire stations and two towns. There's all kinds of buildings. Those are two that come to my mind. But I don't know if any of these people were involved in any of those, but do we should be able, we should be able to find out pretty easily. Right. And be like, hey, if, if this happened to be one of those three companies, hey, how did this company do on that project? Because mm -hmm. that information I think weighs heavily into, yes, you guys are the lowest bidder, but we have two people who say they did not enjoy right the experience. DEW yeah. is the contractor that did the Woodstock safety building last year. Or was it last year? It was the right. a year ago now. Yeah. Yeah. And Adam has his hand up as well. Josh's question aren't we already past that point though? Because didn't we do the pre qualification? And if you mm -hmm. were allowed to bid, that meant you. Past our screen. I think so. Yeah, I think that when we said these are, these firms are qualified, we're sending them our RFP. We were pretty much saying, yeah, like in, in Joe's words, they're all players. Um, I would just kind of kind of validate what you just said, Ben. Is that that process is has happened, and for those it, it, at this point, it's more out of personal interest. Folks could easily go to each of their websites, and these are well developed companies. They're going to list their projects that they've you know, recent, you know, pages and pages of region, recent large scale projects that are um, can kind of, you know, that's their resume, so to speak. 
Okay, so I guess the uh, the business we've got the, the um, uh, intended uh, action for the board tonight was to make an award. Um, I, I and Jim and I had some uh, discussion about what the law requires. I'm certainly not a, a legal expert in you know Vermont bid law. Um, whether we're required to make that award tonight um, or if it's just the, the bid opening, I, I do believe we are. You know, just reading the statute, we're obligated to make the award to the you know lowest qualified bid. Um, so I don't know. Uh, I guess I'll uh, hand it over to others uh, tonight to uh, whether we make the award tonight or or give it a cycle. You want to make a motion? Yes. Is there a motion? I make a motion to accept DW as the winning bid for the work. And now I open for discussion on that. Give me a second. Do I have a second? Any further discussion? I'll hand it back to you. <laughs> <laughs> Matt? Um, so I work in construction institutional big projects. Um, this looks pretty straightforward in terms of like they were asked to bid certain data points. And so maybe it is purely apples to apples. But usually when we get a large construction bid, it takes us weeks, sometimes months to get our bid apples to apples um, for projects of this of this size, hundred million plus dollar projects to, to see whether there are assumptions, you know, but that's for the whole building. This is clearly just for the construction management piece. So as just part of this discussion, um, we would never open bids and make a decision like that. It was always like, call them, ask for clarification, sit down and, you know, I mean, we have professionals who just ask clarifying questions. That's all they do for a living is to try to get bids to be apples to apples. So um, I would consider whether we take some time to review them before making a decision. Sure. Bob? Yeah, um, I agree with that sentiment. Um, we're, we're pro forma, identical pro forma contracts uh, submitted with the RFPs that the three bidders uh, agreed that they would sign or does the contract process now begin? The actual writing of the contract would do. Well, the sample AIA contracts were part of the RFP process. So everybody received the same sample of the contract that we will be using. It's a standardized um, construction contract. Okay, so if we if we let's say we voted to go ahead and award to do, and then you guys started negotiating the fine details of those contracts, and by the end of the day, you know the five million has turned into six million. Uh, are we still obligated? Or let's for argument's sake, let's say it actually rose above the others. H how much latitude is there in the actual execution of the contract? You know, discovering loopholes, disagreements on what the the specimen contract meant or said. I would think yeah, we'd want to get down that road a little bit with it before formally awarding. But I don't know. I don't know how this stuff works. That's a good point. I'm sorry. I keep raising my hand. Uh, my um, I do that stuff for a living, Bob. So I think it's a valid. Um, it's a valid uh, consideration. Um, Pretty unusual to see, at least in my field, I'm in IT, uh, usual to see bid prices go up uh, during contract negotiations. But Matt, you may have a different experience. Well, a really good question, Bob. So a lot of times we'll have the bidders actually submit them, their markups to the pro forma contract so that you have red line contracts submitted with the numbers. And then you can see um, what risk they're trying to allocate to the owner of the, of the building. Because sometimes it doesn't come down to the numbers, it comes down to something like, you know, we won't warranty our work for six months, you know, where someone else is saying we'll come back and fix it, right? So um, that, that's a really good question. It sounds like we gave the standard documents, but I don't think we asked for the markups as part of the bid. We did not. Okay. Hmm. Anna? <clears throat> Anna? Thanks. Yeah, I think... Um from my perspective, given the drastic difference between this one compared to the other two, 
And it sounds like there's a couple of little details that we need to iron out. I, uh, from my perspective, again, I would be much more comfortable having some time to dig through these and um, again, having Joe and other experts go through them also and have some time to look through them before we, we vote in our award. Yes, Sam. Um, yeah, I mean, I, like I, I was just doing the motion so that we could open up for discussion. I'm also of the of the feeling of I just said to Matt, I was like, I don't trust something when it's so much different than, than the other bids. You know, I uh, it's it's because it feels like it's too good to be true. You know, the other one's nine, and you know, and the other one before that was eight what eight. seven eight like they're about they're close they're very close and then this one is you know um so it, it would be nice if that was if this was accurate but um i definitely think um looking into some of the suggestions matt just brought up um before uh accepting any bid and maybe uh just with the plan that we really do have to the next meeting we do have to accept it but the, keep the timeline. The mm -hmm. timeline. Yeah. Um, I guess. Sorry, not to the meeting, but you you want to withdraw your motion? Yeah, I can. I can withdraw my motion, or we can vote it on it. Yeah, the motion. You just need Lydia to. Yes, I, I retract my second. <laughs> <laughs> I make a motion to wait until next meeting and do further research. Okay, great. And um, if you would uh, accept a. Uh, an elaboration of your motion with my second uh, to have Joe and Jim uh, do said research and report back to us next meeting before a decision. Yeah. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay, the motion passes and we'll have more information at the next meeting. Thank you, everybody, for bearing with me on that stuff. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. The next item on the agenda is a logo update, to which there is no update at this time, so we'll just move right on. <clears throat> next hey, we'll can I just, oh. Sorry, can I chime in? I, I apologize, I missed last meeting, um, and I didn't get to see the logos that were presented. Is there a way to get our eyes on those? Um, we can have Raina send those to you, um, if you'd like. Uh, <laughs> I'm getting Adam nodding, and I know he also was not at the last meeting. So, Adam, you can say whether you wanted to receive them also. But yes, I would love to see them. Thank you. Oh, okay. they, are, they are in the board book from last month. I tried to open yeah, them. I didn't need to be open. called out for missing last meeting, Anna. <laughs> yeah. Well, I just saw you nodding. I thought maybe you'd want to see them. But, Raina, I tried to use the link, but I'll try again um, from the meeting minutes uh, and see if I can't get into them and drop you an email if I cannot. Okay, sounds good. Thank you. There's one of them. All right. Um, we have a letter of resignation. Does anybody want to speak to that, Dana or Jerry? We received a resignation from Kathy Costello. Kathy was in charge of our PALS program at uh, Woodstock Elementary School. She's been a member of our faculty for a number of years and has done some outstanding work with some really challenging situation. So we appreciate her efforts and she is moving on to another position. Okay, um, is there, yeah, Matt? Um, I think we've talked about this before. Do we do exit interviews? Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, Cause this sounded a little abrupt and it's the way it's written. Um, so that'd be helpful just to know. And <clears throat> I know we don't, um, vote on these but uh maybe we can have a little discussion um we we lost the librarian at wes and she seemed to be phenomenal um i know we lost our music teacher at comfort school um and i know the librarian who left cited the fact that her position was uh, how do you say like part-time at one school part-time at another school Mm -hmm. And I know as a board, when we did uh, <clears throat> consolidation, that, you know, that was a way to keep costs down. But if we have schools that can sustain uh, full-time positions because they've got 300 kids in them, should we really be having special teachers sort of move from building to building if that's causing attrition? And and so this um, 
was the time during our meeting. I thought I'd bring that up to other board members that if our specials teachers are asked to move from campus to campus during the day or during the week, and there's a pattern of that leading to resignations, I would I would hope that as a board, we would look at that and consider whether that was like the right approach. But more of a comment. Thank you. It's a good point. <clears throat> All right, so we accept her resignation. And next up, we have committee reports. Um, starting with the finance. Oh, no, no, wait a minute. Yeah, committee. Committee updates. Does the finance committee have any updates? Uh, finance did not meet in August, or yeah, we will meet in September. Okay, uh, policy committee. Yes, we have um, two policies to discuss. One is uh, for adoption, <clears throat> teaching and learning. Again, this has been presented before, codifying educational priorities mm -hmm. along with the support for the graduate strategic goals. Um, so I would like to have a motion for adoption, but I want to. There are two minor edits that I just noticed. One is that this is not a rough draft, and. Uh, and also that um, basic, so Raina will have to do some minor editing and that is now Mountain Views, not um, the prior. So um, with that, I would like to uh, ask for adoption of that. Is there a motion to adopt the teaching and learning um, policy? I make a motion to adopt the teaching and learning policy. Is there a second? Second. Any discussion? All those in favor of adopting the teaching and learning policy, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? All right, that policy is adopted. Thank you, Elliot. Okay, and and second me. is uh, one of the school uh, safety model uh, policies. And the first one is we have, it's a pair of them. We're working on the second one. We have some other things to do, but this is F3, fire emergency preparedness. Um, basically that there are gonna be uh, drills uh, twice a year for this. and this is presented as a second reading with adoption, hopefully next month. Is there a motion to move it to adoption for next month? Which one are we we're doing it on the clean draft, you said? Yes, I mean, you can there, talk, I put them both so you can see what changes. What it was, yes, I'm trying to do easily. It was pretty straightforward. Yeah. Okay. Thank you, Ryan. Is there a second? A second. Any discussion or questions for the policy committee on the clean draft? All right. Uh, are we ready to vote? All in favor, please say aye. 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 Okay. Any opposed? All right. Thank you. Thank you. Um, buildings and grounds committee update. Um, sure. So we did meet on August 21st. Um, we did not have a quorum, so no votes were taken, but we did discuss some of the general uh, status updates on the projects. Um, a lot has occurred between August 21st and tonight, so I'm sure Joe will be able to fill in, but I, I want to hit some of the highlights. Um, he, he and his team were incredibly busy this summer on top of the, the flooding that occurred. Um, the Killington Roof Project uh, was 90% complete at the time of our August meeting. Um, the playground at Killington was complete, but for the mulch, but I, and I've heard that's gone in as well as a weather station. Uh, we removed oil tanks from Reading. We removed an oil tank from Killington. Um, we fixed a roof a roof leak at Wes uh, related to the solar install, but luckily the solar folks won't pay for that. Um, at the high school, uh, the conversion of the heating system from steam to hydronics is, is well underway. Prior to the classes starting, they were able to finish the classrooms. They were still working on the hallways and they're now advancing into the boiler rooms to, to fix both uh, boilers. There were some delays due to a, a contractor on that job, JCI. And then you probably noticed driving by the school over Labor Day weekend that Daniel's uh, was camped out on probably some of the hottest days of this year, uh, installing the new lift station to move our septic 
uh, affluent uh, up to a level <laughs> high enough that it will drain to the, the town septic system. Um, and I don't know the outcome, but they're off the job. So assuming uh, assuming all went it's well, <laughs> assuming everything is flowing and the pump, the pump trucks that were there just in case have, have pulled away. So again, just thanks to your team. And um, in addition to those projects, they were hit by the floods and there was some damage done to our um, maintenance and storage building over by the Dead River facility. Um, there were damage done to the fields that's being remediated now, but otherwise we, um, being up at a higher level where our buildings are, we were mostly uh, spared the worst of, of the flooding. Um, and with that, I, I think I'll let Joe fill in because a lot else has happened since our meeting. Sure, I'll, I'll be brief because you got the uh, bulk of it out of the way. So uh, yeah, the Killing Kimberly project was completed. Uh, I got a small punch list uh, and they'll be up there next week to finish up a few things there. Uh, the weather station is pretty good. I think we just got to paint it, if that's correct, yeah. Throw a little paint on there, we're good to go. Um, we're also moving forward on the uh, HVAC improvements at Woodstock Elementary School. So I have some engineering uh, studies that are going on right now. We'll be meeting with some folks in a couple of weeks to look at structural stuff and see if we can change out some of those units on the roof. Um, Woodstock Union High School, the flood. Well, we were able to condition the fields enough where I think we're in great shape right now. All the fields are being utilized. There's just a small space down below on a couple of practice fields that uh, we weren't able to get back into playing condition. So the folks will have to stay off of that. Uh, everything else went pretty good with the flooding. We didn't incur a huge amount of loss, I'd say uh, somewhere between 10 and $15,000 worth of material. So we didn't do too bad at all with the uh, flood. As far as the heating projects concerned over at Woodstock uh, Union, we're again, we're out of all the classrooms. We still have some control work, running some wires down the hallways, and we'll be shifting gears and moving into the boiler room here over the next three weeks. Hopefully, we'll have that pretty close to being done. Fingers crossed, we're not going to enter the school heating season uh, without any heat. Uh, we did drill a geothermal test well on the corner of the parking lot uh, two weeks ago. Uh, we downloaded all the data from that and hopefully within about a week and a half, two weeks, they'll give us an indication of whether or not uh, geothermal would be feasible here on this property. The input I got from the driller seemed to be all positive. And as a matter of fact, he seemed to think we might be able to do it with less wells than what our architect was suggesting. So that's a godsend if that comes true. Mm -hmm. um, lift station. Yeah, we ran into a few problems with the lift station. We had some problems getting it commissioned. And then some, once we did get it in place, um, it wasn't properly pitched. So we had some problems actually pushing stuff out. Uh, today, we finalized it. We have the alarm hooked up. Everything is running. Uh, we did some minor engineering changes to get it to function properly. Uh, we're within warranty specs, so no issues there. And um, that's about it. I think I hit everything else that we had talked about. Wow. Thank <clears throat> yeah, thank you. But we got around some committee and, and the staff. Really great work. Thanks. Um, I don't believe there's a negotiations hiring and retention fee update at this time. Are there any working group updates? Um, communications. I realize I haven't called a meeting in yet. I will call one shortly. Foliage though is around the corner, so I don't know how much you guys can count on me. It's pretty available. But once uh, November hits, I am. I will be all yours. I swear. Um, but yes, I will. I will call a working group. Apologies that hasn't happened yet. And I expect that the configuration and enrollment will get active once the mascot is um, <clears throat> being discussed. I did make some notes, you know, of what Bryce just said of different um, school uh, choice towns that I wasn't aware of. So I've added them to my list of uh, towns to send to see if they have listservs or whatever and to add them to my list of places to post to when I'm asked to do that. All right, any other groups? 
Thank you. Um, we need yeah. to approve the minutes from the August 7th meeting. Is there a motion to approve? So Is there a second? A second. Okay, Matt and Clara, thank you. All in favor of approving minutes, please say aye. Aye. Uh, Any opposed? I need to abstain. Oh, I'll need to abstain because I wasn't there. Okay. Yeah, I, I didn't vote because I wasn't there. Okay, thank you. <laughs> All right. Um, we now have another opportunity for public comment. If there's anyone who would like to speak, we can raise his hand there in that presentation. Please, if you would like to say something. Is he still on? Yes. Yeah. Yes. Oh. oh, hi. Um, thank you for allowing me to listen in. Obviously, it's public, but. Um, <laughs> There is a, I mean, I, I just wanted to comment on the, the CM process. I will ask in my own office about anything about the, um, the three firms, which were pre-qualified uh, earlier. Um, I suppose the biggest thing I, I would look at is apples to apples for those who already know how to do this and will look is really look for any, um, anything that for any reason would disqualify them or not. I mean, um, but right now they're the low bidder by far. <clears throat> and um, I do think that it's probably good to, if it's legal, uh, Jim, this is your your thing, it's probably good to talk to them and, and at some point and see um, if there's anything that's missing or any, you know, give them the uh, opportunity to discover if there's anything missing. But in Vermont, this is the process. And I'm glad you're doing it, and I'm glad everything else is going forward. That's all. Thanks, Lee. Thanks, Lee. Anybody else? All right. Um, at this time, we do need to enter into two separate executive sessions. The first executive session under 1DSA 313A1. B is a financial matter uh, to be discussed. Um, so that means that those who are not, the, the board will remain. And I believe Jim and Sherry are invited to remain as well. Will you also invite Raph? Raph, okay. And those um, who are planning to stay for the second executive session will wait out on this side, please. I guess I'll make that motion to enter executive session for the purpose in. Okay, all those in favor? Aye. 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 So, Sherry, do you put those folks in with the waiting room? <laughs> so, those who are Raina will put herself in the waiting but Linda would need to sign off. Uh, Dina, do you want Dina to have a conversation if you want her to sign it? She may be able to do that. But no, I don't want it. 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 I don't <laughs> Sherry, I can't seem to put myself in a waiting room. I can't put myself in the waiting room, so. I'm sorry, I can't hear you. I can't put myself in the waiting room without uh, taking myself off as host. So I have to reassign and then you can put me in the waiting room. Can I but I am you? I'm the main host and I can't oh. leave, so I'm yeah, gonna right. have to sign off completely as host. Okay, great. I have a minute to leave. All right, thank you, Raina. It might have been somebody else. Yeah, but I was wondering. So we're still here. Yeah. But somebody is on the yeah. so not with you. All right, we have a bunch to so make, make sure you stop recording. Yes, thank you. Go to the table.